Hi guys, I'm Truthman from Overclocking TV and you are now with uh, someone else from Intel. Um, could you just present yourself? What's your job, which country you come from, and if you enjoy Taipei? Sure. So, hello, I'm Carl Schertz. I'm uh, from Oregon in the uh, United States. And I'm the desktop product marketing uh, processor, uh, marketing engineer uh, for the enthusiast segment. So I, I look at all of our top end products. I've been doing this for Intel for about four and a half years. Uh, started off with the very first quad-core product that we launched. Uh, let's see, that'll be back in 2006. Uh, Codenamed Kentsfield, if you remember that. Uh, it was one of my favorite products. Yep. Um, the first, uh, based on the, the, the Conroe, we, we took that part, turned it into a quad-core. Really an amazing product for Intel. and Had a lot of fun uh, overclocking as well. Did very, very well in the market. So I, I love the enthusiast market. Love guys that love to tinker with our products. Um, it's been a lot of fun. First thing to kind of keep in mind with these two products is that, that we've launched. Um, we're kind of experimenting at Intel a little bit with uh, overclocking and providing new features for the overclocking market. Uh, we've been looking at the desktop segment as um, beginning, some of it's beginning to move to mobile, right? Where we're kind of seeing users, you know, they bought a desktop, but their next purchase is probably mobile. So who's left, right? I mean, what are they buying now? What you, what you see is left is those that really care about what you can get from a desktop product. And um, so what you end up is kind of a hyper-segmentation, hyper-verticalization of this market. And the enthusiast overclockers is actually a big component of that. So what we've done is we've taken our products that are based on the Nahalem architecture. And we're look, we've looked at two products that we know we can unlock and actually provide some additional features to the overclocker. And we know overclockers love to have all of the knobs they can to play with these products. Right? Don't, you know, don't limit me at all. Let me just see what everything I can do. Let me, let me play with voltage. Let me play with the, 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 the ratios. Let me play with turbo. Let me play with, um, you know, the, the memory speed. Let me play with the ratios there as well. So they want all of that. So that's what we've done here. We've taken two products, a, a quad core and a dual core. They both support hyperthreading and turbo. Um, one, the higher part has uh, 8 meg of cache. The lower part, the 655K has 4 meg of cache. And uh, we've unlocked the multipliers on those parts. So what that means is users who in the past been overclocking kind of using base clock alone, right? They raise the base clock from 133, which it is today. They'll bump it up as high as they can get. Uh, they'll hit some kind of limitation here on the, on the memory bus or maybe on the CPU, and they can't quite get as high as they want. So, but you know, we're still seeing very good numbers even with that. Uh, but unlock the multiplier, and you get kind of two things. You're, you're able to raise those core ratios without having to really impact the rest of the system. So that's actually a pretty big deal. And if you're a kind of a casual overclocker, you don't really push these things to the limit. You're not doing liquid nitrogen uh, cooling. You may not even have a very expensive liquid cooler itself, right? You're just, you've got a really good air cool uh, product. Uh, and you just want to overclock a little bit. So with this capability, you can do that. You can just overclock a little. Uh, you might get three or four, um, you know, additional bins. In other words, you know, four, maybe 500 megahertz. And that's a really big boost in performance. So, uh, so that, that's a big added feature for someone that's kind of getting interested in this. And uh, lots of motherboard products out there supply the, this capability. Add into that uh, the ability with turbo. So you, what you're actually doing is you're not raising the ratio per se of the, the core product itself, you're actually raising the ratios of the turbo multipliers. So what that means is you, you can, for a part that has four cores, you can change the multiplier independently for each of the active cores on the product. So uh, say you've got one core that's active, you can actually have set that ratio to be higher than you would for, say, the four core where you, you know, you're not going to have as much power uh, available to one, it's going to be spread ac across all four of those cores. Um, so when you overclock, it, it's going to go as high as it can depending on the um, benchmark you're running or the application you're running. That may be one thread and therefore that core is going to really kick up there high. It's going to overclock even higher. And that's kind of a function of turbo plus overclocking together. So we, we see that alone as just a big value. Um, again, not having to raise the voltage of the other components because you're independently raising those ratios is a big added value as well. So we, we, we think our you know, customers that love to overclock are just going to have a lot of fun with these parts. In general, in that space, we, we tend to see anywhere from uh, 15 to 25,000 parts a quarter. Um, and you know that, that's readily available today. You can see the, those, those numbers from, uh, from their suppliers. So that, that, that for us is, is very healthy volume. 
Uh, we expect that to continue. Um, with any product in, in this space, you know, Intel likes to drive more and more performance. Uh, so I can't comment, of course, on future products. But uh, as usual, usual, you should expect to see more stuff either later this year or early next year that would play uh, either in the high end or even you know, slightly below that. Uh, we, one, we've gotten very good feedback on the Gulf Town product, the 6-core uh, 980X. Uh, very good reviews, very good overclocking. Uh, there are multiple applications out there that are scaling to 12 threads to six cores. Um, some games actually do that very well, which isn't very typical. Uh, most games tend to lag in terms of their uh, thread support, um, but there are lots of multimedia applications, both video encoding, 3D rendering that scale today, right? They didn't even need to uh, uh, you know, optimize or, or re recompile their code. They, they already scaled to those threads. Uh, so we see very good demand for it, uh, very good uh, response from it, and we're, we're pretty excited about it, actually. That's a, a long process, as you pointed out. Um, it's actually around anywhere from a uh, five to six year process from inception to uh, actual launch. Uh, so it begins with research and development. We begin working with architects to decide what kind of features are really going to be needed, you know, uh, three to five generations out in terms of CPU architecture. And we, we engage with them very early to look at all of the feature sets. Uh, both for desktop, for mobile, for server, and of course my focus is desktop. So what we feed into that process are definitely overclocking features, uh, performance features, uh, anything around uh, the benchmarks that we're looking at today that would bring those numbers up, uh, but also you know keep us within a power budget. Uh, we don't want to uh, push the whole world, even Extreme Edition, to go beyond what we're really looking at in terms of a cost structure for this segment as well. Um, so it really begins with those uh, ideas in mind. Uh, you work through that architecture development phase and, and uh, R&D phase until you finally get to uh, a design that you bring to the fab. Uh, you begin uh, with uh, engineering samples that come out of that based on the process technology that that particular architecture is destined for. So a great example of Gulf Town, that was meant for 32 nanometers, designed for that started you know, four to five years ago, uh, looking at how many cores we wanted, what kind of cache size we wanted, what was the memory speed we were going to support on, on that die, uh, were we going to drop into an existing platform or did we need a new chipset support for that. Uh, what kind of socket was going to be needed, what kind of power delivery was going to be there. And all that kind of came to fruition with, you know, our internal board that we use for debug, uh, the, the, the wafers finally coming out, getting into package, getting us into the, to the lab so we could test it out, and, uh, you know, finally getting those products fully qualified with our partners, with our, uh, our channel partners, as well as our, you know, our, our multinational customers. Uh, to fully validate them and get them into for the channel, you know, they finally end up in a box. They get shipped out to, you know, multiple uh, distributors. And finally, you know, you can go to folks like Newegg and uh, buy them off of their products or uh, off of their websites or go into a local retail shop and, and get the box products or, of course, buy a, a, a fully completed system from a, from a customer. So very long process. Um, it's really not done in a matter of a quarter. And decisions that, that uh, are products that you're seeing launched today uh, work to determine what that would look like and how that would come to market started, you know, two years ago in many cases, to figure out, you know, where is it going to fit, what's it going to cost, uh, what prices are the right ones for that, how many uh, products are there going to be, what will the feature sets be. So it's a it's a pretty long and complex process, and where you know you end up making decisions two years ago that you hope will still be right today. So in many cases, it's also a bit of a gamble. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're pretty confident in the read we've gotten from the market. We think the pricing is right. We think the feature is right. We think it's going to do pretty well. So yeah, That's the crystal ball uh, gamble again. You're kind of looking out thinking, where is the desktop market going to be in two to three years? And uh, we, as I was mentioning earlier, we see a lot of that um, traditional market moving to mobile. So who, who's left? It's people that really care about these products, and overclockers are a big piece of that. And uh, they're not going away. They're always going to want more performance. They're always going to want more power uh, delivered to that platform to give them the performance you know they're looking for. And we could kind of see that coming uh, really two years ago. And we wanted to bring a product to that market that would actually keep it really uh, going strong, right? And we didn't want it to fizzle out. We didn't want it to get so small that it wouldn't be worth developing cool products like this. So it needs to be a healthy size. And, and we saw overclocking it still is a pretty key piece of, of, uh, of keeping that segment alive, so yes. 
first, you know, some markets are going to develop differently than others. But if you take mature markets first, for example, and um, I think Dottie actually brought this up in his keynote earlier, but we actually think over time those kind of markets will begin to have even more computers in their homes. I, I'm probably a bad example, but I have five computers in my house. Uh, either way, I've, I've got a lot of computers in my in my home, and uh, I think that will sort of be the trend. There'll always be probably one uh, computer uh, that's probably going to be a uh, a stationary device that, that's used in the home. And then you may end up with smartphones, uh, everyone's going to have a laptop, maybe even a, a netbook uh, that they just take, you know, for, for quick trips or they, you know, go on vacation, they're going to take a, a smaller device. Uh, but there'll be different usage models for different needs. And I think a desktop is always going to be needed. Uh, there may be multiple reasons for that. One may actually be uh, stationary storage for uh, you know, secure way of backing up all of your, your memories, right? I think that that's one device. But also, you're still going to get more performance out of a desktop on average per price than you will for, for mobile. And I think customers are going to demand that. They're not going to want to, um, in many cases, uh, compromise on performance. Um, they'll want to do both, right? They want the mobility and they're going to want the performance. So they'll end up buying both, which is what we've done in our house. So. Gigabyte's doing some pretty amazing things, and, and I've actually I didn't know about that product until today, so I, I was pretty uh, uh, surprised and actually amazed at what they're able to do. Um, I'm not sure if there's a, a big market beyond those that really, really are the hardcore enthusiasts, those that really want to break the records, and maybe that's what they're driving for. And actually, I think that helps us quite a bit because it shows what our technology can actually do to, together, both our CPUs as well as uh, their, their motherboard and power delivery technology. Uh, we know in many cases our CPUs have a lot more headroom in terms of their power and, uh, and performance than what we can actually deliver to the market on a on a safe and you know cost structure basis, and they're taking advantage of that, and that actually shows that um, our uh, transistor technology, our ability to create uh, these really really complex devices, actually can do even more than uh, than what we actually deliver to the broad market, and then they show that there's a lot of really really smart guys thinking up really amazing stuff, and our our fabs are able to you know, finally bring that to market in a real product that can do more than we actually even thought it probably could. So I think it helps out um, both of, of our markets. It, it shows that uh, technology leadership is a key component to, to having a, a really robust entire product line. And their ability to do that, I think, helps out everyone. The first thing to keep in mind is overclocking by definition is running our parts out of tested specifications, right? Uh, which means we haven't gone through rigorous testing to make sure that these parts will actually run as uh, per our quality requirements uh, under those specs, right? So if you're beyond uh, the frequency, the voltage, uh, any of those things, uh, Intel isn't tested uh, at those levels. We do some testing, of course, internally, but it's not the same kind of rigorous testing that the, the whole product line gets um, based on how we spec the part. So we, we can't guarantee that it will function. Uh, it, it, it may not. Uh, you may uh, run the part for a year. It might be okay. You may run it for six weeks. It may, it may not be. And some of that depends, again, on the, the motherboard you've got uh, and all of the uh, other aspects that you're doing in order to get the frequency you're trying to hit in, again, voltage, um, uh, the frequency itself, and uh, how, how well you're cooling the product. All of that, you know, makes a big difference. We, of course, have fail-safes within the CPU. If it gets too hot, we actually shut it down because we don't want it to burn, right? We don't want you to um, have a, you know, an, a fire in your house. That's something we don't want to happen. Um, but we can't, we can't guarantee. So it, it may last for a while. It may not last at all. And that's something we just haven't tested, so we really can't guarantee that. I have, over, I have one in, in my personal office in my house where I've overclocked a little bit, uh, but not a whole lot. Uh, I tend to, to kind of do that stuff mostly at work. Uh, one, I, I'm a little bit nervous that the machine will die, and I don't really want that to happen. I've got pretty important information on there, and, and uh, the time actually, unfortunately, to rebuild the machine is something I don't have. Um, I I've actually have uh, lots of kids at home, and I don't have time to sit in my office and rebuild the machine after it died. So I, I've got a 975 um, system I built with uh, Intel's motherboard, our, uh, um, uh, let's see, it's uh, Smackover. I can't remember the, yeah, the, the, the code name there. And um, I've, I've got it cranked up about three to four bins. So I'm, I'm up above, you know, several, uh, several 200, 300 megahertz above the, the stock. And I'm using, again, turbo to do that. So, you know, when it's not working, it stays at idle. 
So I'm not too terribly worried about that. I think over you know, two years is probably going to be just fine. I actually don't use that system as much as some of the other systems. So I think the long longevity on that is going to be pretty good. Uh, the really hardcore overclocking, you know, I do with the, the guys at work. Right, We're really pushing things to the limit. Uh, I tend to kind of leave the voltages where they are at home because I know that actually has a pretty big impact on the uh, life of the product itself. And so um, at work, you know, we can go beyond that and we can really kind of test the limits. And of course, we're doing this, you know, we don't do this across the entire distribution. Um, if we did, you know, we'd probably actually spec it that way, right? So we're taking a handful of parts. We're saying, oh, look, you know, this one gets really good, only a little voltage. And we go, oh, let's, let's crank it up some more. Let's see what we can get. And, you know, we're, we're getting within our own labs some of the same numbers that you see on some of the websites. Um, I don't, I haven't personally done any LN2 myself. Uh, I don't have a, a, you know, I don't know that we have the right setup to do that in Oregon. I think we have some in Folsom where they've done a little bit of that. And uh, we also have other partners in the industry where we, we kind of do some of that testing ourselves uh, jointly to see what kind of numbers we get. Uh, but I, I personally love to see those numbers. I think it's exciting to see what they can do with this silicon. Um, you know, in some cases, we're surprised. I mean, oh, really? You know, cause one, there's a distribution of parts. Sometimes guys get a really good part that really overclocks well, and uh, other, you know, they'll post the numbers. Oh, look at this! Look at this! And, and other guys will do the very same thing, same motherboard, same process, and they won't get quite as good. And you think, well, you know, sometimes it's just the luck of the draw. It's a game. It, it's a game. Sometimes you're just super lucky and. Uh, sometimes we just are really surprised to see some numbers that get so high at, at even lower voltages than we would have thought. So that's, that's actually pretty exciting. Well, I think it's a great idea. One, I, I think it helps to educate those that are, may be interested in overclocking but uh, don't quite know what to do or you know, what motherboards to buy, what tools to use, um, how far is too far, you know, how far is okay. Um, you know, what's the best gas kind of experience in the industry for some parts in terms of how long will they last. Uh, there's a good bit of data out there on a lot of these websites these days and I think, you know, your, your efforts to educate some overclockers to get them a little more experience in what they're doing is great. It broadens the market for us. It helps other folks to kind of understand what they can get from doing this kind of stuff. It shows our technology. It shows that we've got, you know, great products that we can uh, really give to this community that can really help. So. Pretty exciting stuff. Okay. Thanks for your time and hope to see you maybe soon for another interview. You bet. Thank you very much. Welcome.